On today's episode, we are diving deep into the aftermath of the second Starship test flight. What happened, why, and what the future looks like for the world's largest rocket. This is the Space Race. On November 18th, after 212 days of repairs, tinkering, construction, investigation, and testing, SpaceX was ready to fly their Starship once again. It's safe to say that the second test flight of the world's largest rocket was much more successful than its first, but the Saturday launch had both its astounding successes and disappointing setbacks. First, let's quickly go over the flight itself to give context to those who weren't able to catch it live. At around 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 18th, the team at Starbase Boca Chica, Texas, began the fueling process. Everything went very smoothly here with the team taking their planned hold at T-40 seconds to double check that everything was good to go before continuing. At T-5 seconds, the deluge system kicked on, shooting thousands of gallons of water in preparation for engine ignition, which happened a few seconds later. At T-4 seconds, we had liftoff. Starship rose easily into the air, no strange drifting, no slow climb, just a steady acceleration as it left the pad. At T plus 1 minute 12 seconds, Starship was traveling so fast that it had already hit max Q, the point at which the vehicle was under the most amount of dynamic pressure it would experience for the entire flight. At T plus 2 minutes 40, most booster engines begin to shut down. This was done slowly, not all at once. You can see the engines shut down in small groups if you watch carefully. At almost the same time, Starship's engines activated, using the flame diverter vents at the top of Booster 9 to perform a hot staging maneuver and ease the two vehicles apart without losing momentum. At T plus 2 minutes 50, the two stages are separate, and Booster 9 begins its flip for the boost backburn maneuver that will take it back to the Gulf of Mexico. But it never gets there. The flip is good, the trajectory looks stable, but several engines fail to light, and a small explosion is seen at the rear of the booster. At T plus 3 minutes and 20 seconds, the flight termination system on booster 9 is activated, and it's blown to pieces. Ship 25, meanwhile, is doing just fine, and in fact is perfect for almost 5 more minutes of flight. It isn't until puffs of vapor are spotted at T plus 8 minutes or so that something appears to go wrong, and we lose telemetry. It's later confirmed that the FTS was activated for Ship 25 around this time, and both vehicles are lost. However, with a flight time almost double that of the previous test on April 20th, and every primary test objective completed smoothly, SpaceX staff and observers on the ground have cause for celebration. But every success could always be better in spaceflight, and so while thinking ahead to the future, it's time we looked at the aftermath of IFT-2. Let's start with the biggest question on everyone's minds. How did the pad hold up? The short answer is very well. The longer answer is that the launch pad and hardware were the absolute MVPs of this flight. The condition of the Starbase pad was notorious in the aftermath of the Starship's first test flight back in April. Without a flame diverter or really any sort of serious attempts to mitigate the massive overpressure and explosive power from the rocket's first stage, a gigantic crater was blown into the sand at Boca Chica, very nearly obliterating the OLM and mangling vital parts of the launch tower and tank farm. This damage was a huge concern in the FAA mishap investigation, as chunks of debris were flung huge distances from the launch site, forcing SpaceX to really hustle to install their planned flame diverter system after the initial hole was filled in. This new system was the now-famous water-cooled steel plate system, a reverse shower head that pumps thousands of gallons of water upwards and away from the underside of the rocket. The idea was that the water would act to both cool the steel plate sitting just under the engines of the first stage booster, as well as contain some of the noise and pressure created by the initial liftoff thrust, and it worked like a charm. As soon as that clock hit T-5 seconds and the deluge turned on, we immediately saw that things were going to be different with this launch. Just like in the recent static fire tests, the water absorbed most of the power of the Raptor engine array and turned into steam, giving us this great view of pulsating clouds of water vapor instead of gritty dust clouds filled with dangerous chunks of flying concrete. The pad itself had technicians on it after only three hours of waiting, and less than a day later, 
Elon was standing on the thing giving us a close-up picture of the basically pristine site. Elon posted on X, just inspected the Starship launch pad, and it is in great condition. No refurbishment needed to the water-cooled steel plate for next launch. An astounding difference from April 20th, those engineers deserve a standing ovation. That does not mean that there was no damage, however, with clear shots of dangling cables from the chopsticks and a battered quick disconnect proving that even a perfect launch can damage your hardware. But this isn't anything that can't be fixed. Launches always damage some sort of the launch apparatus. It's a hazard of using explosions to push vehicles into space. Now for the flight itself, let's split this into the good things and the bad things. You're gonna wanna stick around for both. First off, let's look at what went wrong here, because honestly, it's not a whole lot. Yes, there were two activations of the flight termination systems, but that in itself is actually a good part of this test, which might sound weird, but I'll explain why in a second. During the liftoff phase, it was noted that there were a couple of pieces of something flying around near the base of the OLM. It looked a bit like a piece of corrugated metal, but it could have been anything. Obviously, anything not nailed down well enough would have been thrown clear, so really this is an indicator that the site needs to be more thoroughly checked for this sort of material before a launch. All of the other bad parts of this launch were more or less related to the maneuvers that both parts of this rocket attempted just after stage separation. First, the booster attempted its flip for the boost back burn. Honestly, the flip itself looked great, and everything seemed to align well, but something in the rocket really didn't like that maneuver, and there was a small explosion at the engines when they tried to start back up. It's likely that the booster could have made the attempt to fly back to the Gulf of Mexico with just a few of its engines, but too many engines failed to light, which very likely caused an imbalance in the thrust. The booster began to swiftly fly off course, and the FTS was activated out of caution, which was definitely the right call. Meanwhile, Starship itself was last seen accelerating in what looked like a perfect trajectory. Everything was going very smoothly until suddenly, it wasn't. Some puffs of air and the engines cut out suddenly seconds before the SpaceX team intended to do so. At first, this looked like a simple loss of telemetry, that the ship was likely still gliding on its way to Hawaii, but unfortunately it was confirmed that the FTS had been activated for Starship as well. At time of recording, it's still a little unclear as to if the FTS activated automatically or if SpaceX manually flipped the switch, but there are a couple of likely causes. Some observers have reported that the Starship may have been slightly off course, which could have endangered a local population, or that the welds on Ship 25 hadn't held up, breaking the ship open and forcing the FTS to blow. Ship 25 had been a very well-used test article, and those welds had been an issue previously, along with the ship losing heat tiles that had to be replaced right up until days before the launch. Whatever the reason, Ship 25 did not break up cleanly, and it was reported that the nose cone and flaps had survived the initial explosion. They likely burned up on the way down, but that's still a potential hazard that the team will have to deal with in later ship variants. But that was the only bad part of this launch, so let's talk about the good stuff. First and most important, every one of the primary objectives for this flight were hit. Starship flew from the launch pad in a controlled manner without giving the boring company any ideas about new directions to take their drilling techniques. Then, not only did the first stage booster maintain an optimal number of active engines during the ascent, but all 33 engines in its array stayed active, gimbaled, and shut down properly. An amazing feat, especially when you consider what happened in Flight Test 1, and it's likely down to the new electronic thrust vector control system in Booster 9, as well as the upgrades to the engine bay plumbing to stop any leaks from becoming fires. The ETV control system was also just generally responsible for the rocket's ability to very easily stay on its trajectory for this flight. Every gimbling engine operated perfectly, which was especially visible just after stage separation, where the three gimbling center engines on Ship 25 were seen snapping quickly into place once Booster 9 had moved away from the line of fire. And speaking of separation, the hot staging maneuver that was added to this launch did exactly what it was intended to do. The smooth separation was the primary goal of this flight, and it also marked the last flawless thing to work in the whole exercise 
so it was gratifying to see all that testing with the avionics and the reorientation of some of the launch hardware to accommodate for the new height of the rocket was worth it. So first and most obviously, the FAA is going to have to do a mishap investigation. In fact, they've already announced it. We can hear the boos and we get it, but this is literally their whole job. In fact, they don't have a choice here. Once the FTS blew Booster 9 to pieces, the FAA was obligated to complete an investigation. But the good news is that with no reported damage to property, environment, or danger to people, this investigation should be much quicker than the last one. And on top of that, there won't likely be any large changes to the mission hardware this time. And so an environmental review from the fisheries and wildlife crew won't be necessary. However, this does mean that another launch this year is just wildly unlikely to happen. Elon Musk all but confirmed this with a post on X where he says Starship Flight 3 hardware should be ready to fly in three to four weeks. Honestly, it probably wasn't likely to happen even if Starship had been able to hit both of its secondary goals either. There's just not a whole lot of time to reconfigure the next pair of vehicles, plan a flight, and launch it before the holidays, although it would have been cool to see SpaceX try for it. Speaking of, what is likely to even happen for the next test flight? SpaceX is known for making small incremental tests so that they can really focus on problem areas as they come up, so it's a pretty good bet that the company will attempt to launch again with the exact same mission profile. Of course, the focus this time will likely be on nailing that boost back flip and the glide to Hawaii. They already proved they can launch their big rocket and it really looked like it had the power to get to orbit, so they need to prove those technical abilities before trying the next big phase. With that comes the implication of more hardware testing. Ship 25 and Starship in general had been having a problem keeping its heat shield tiles on. One or two falling off during launch isn't such a big deal, but those can add up. SpaceX needs to nail down a good adhesive and attachment procedure, just like NASA did with the old shuttles. The next vehicles are likely to be Ship 28 and Booster 10, with Ship 28 showcasing some big leaps in tech over Ship 25. Booster 10 is a little more elusive, but it's likely that the super heavy first stage will see more minor tweaks so it can navigate that flip better than Booster 9 did. So when is a more realistic time frame for the next test launch? Obviously, SpaceX is really chomping at the bit to do another one. They have several test boosters and Starships lined up for flights, but the odds of it happening in the winter are shaky. It is possible that a launch at the end of January or sometime in February could happen, the FAA has been under pressure from the government to act faster, and SpaceX will waste exactly zero time in making the next vehicle ready for flight. But at the very least, it's safe to say that a flight in March would be almost a certainty if it hasn't happened before then. This also implies that Starship cannot complete enough test flights in time for a 2025 Artemis 3 mission. It's just too much work to get done in between mishap investigations and hardware reconfigurations. For NASA's part, they have said that they want at least 60 test launches before they'll trust crew inside a Starship, which is more lenient than what SpaceX president and CEO Gwen Shotwell wants. When discussing the Dear Moon commercial Starship mission, which was due to launch in 2023 originally and take a crew of artists on an orbital trek around the moon, Shotwell says that she wants at least 100 launches before trusting the vehicle with an untrained crew like that. Fair enough, I suppose we've all seen The Simpsons. But even if SpaceX can really hustle and complete all the testing targets NASA needs, that's the orbital test, the refueling test, the moon travel and landing tests, and all the hardware tests for the human landing system variant of the Starship, it just doesn't seem possible that they could get all of that done in two years. But with so much extra room in the Artemis schedule, it definitely won't matter much. Artemis 3 can be delayed for the little bit of extra time Starship is likely to need. Just like with the Falcon 9's testing, Starship is only going to get more and more consistent with each flight. This next year alone should prove to be some of the most exciting times for this new space race. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real and subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long-form essay and one news update every week, and if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.